welcome to the podcast, Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. I want to say a few words about the shelf life of our media. So in all of world history, by far the most successful and long-lived medium for writing down text and storing information was the papyrus scroll. So this was a form of paper made from papyrus strips. This is a plant that grows in Egypt that were pressed together and produced a roll that was, oh, maybe about a foot tall, let's say, but could be very, very long at 15 feet or more. And you could always add additions and which you then rolled up. And this was handy and durable And we know of cases of papyrus scrolls that were used many, many centuries after they were written. And it was also a very cheap medium to use and was exported by the millions out of Egypt for what was the dominant form of writing in the Eastern Mediterranean and Near East for about 4,000 years. Some of the early codices, that is the book form of binding paper, Uh, also used papyrus as its main material, and this is what extended the dominance of the papyrus medium uh, into the first millennium AD. So printed books that we use today, which are mass-produced, definitely are a technological development that sort of a new chapter in the history of knowledge storage. And also we use a different type of paper uh, for their manufacture. So this is a different medium that we use today, though it's still only 500 years old. And a lot of the books that we produce today would simply not survive very long if you left them on the shelf. Um, I mean, some of them are beginning to disintegrate, even from especially the 19th century books and after are are just not made to be as durable um, and fall apart, and so they have to be put in special collections, and if you try to turn the page, it cracks and disintegrates and so forth. Even less durable have been the various forms of digital reproduction um, that we have been using just in the past few decades. Um, now, we all think that digitization and sort of PDFs and so forth are forever, but <laughs> they're very, very, very recent. Uh, especially if you compare them to the time scales on which things like papyrus book scrolls and early codices were meant to operate and did operate, it remains to be seen how long uh, our current media survive. Think, for example, of you know, c- can you read a floppy disk from the '90s, <laughs> or even as like a, a CD, a burned CD with information? Like, like yes, you know how to get the technology that would enable you to read it, you know, something that we did uh, very casually 20 years ago, but now it's not so accessible. Um, And who knows for how long um, the current form in which we store information online or whatever will remain uh, in, in use and accessible. As Darth Vader says, don't be too proud of this technological terror you've constructed. Okay, so... The second most important means and medium for storing and displaying information from the ancient world are stone inscriptions. These are texts carved onto the surface of a polished block of stone, many of which were put on display in some visible public place or along a street or in the side of a building. Many, many thousands of them are still more or less where they were put then and just as legible. And we have millions of them from the ancient world, from the origin of forms of writing in every location where, you know, scripts were invented, down to, well, the form never actually went out of use. It just kind of declined in popularity relative to earlier periods. And here's the catch. These media of textuality continued to exist for centuries and millennia after the period in which they were carved or written, that is, long after the circumstances that produced them in the first place, into subsequent cultures, later cultures that may be wildly different from the ones that produced them in religion and language, you name it. But they were there. 
So just as ancient texts have a very, very long shelf life, so too inscriptions continued to adorn buildings and to be visible in public spaces. Um, and even in the countryside, you would find things like milestones or tombstones and so on. And this, in many ways, challenges our notions of periodization. The way we carve history up into discrete blocks of you know, cultural time and study each one on the basis of its own cultural productions. And often, we forget the continued coexistence and overlap of ancient forms of writing and textuality and preservation of knowledge that continued into later periods. This is an issue that we discussed also in episode 79 regarding ancient statues with Paroma Chatterjee, that the statues continued to be there. Um, and they're not just an ancient artifact that should be studied as a product of ancient culture also. It was a very prominent part of the Byzantine visual landscape as well. And the same goes for inscriptions. There were ancient cities in Greece and Asia Minor where the whole sides of buildings were covered with very long, very important inscriptions, things such as Augustus's Res Gestae, which we'll be, we will be talking about uh, in this conversation. So in the same way that when we're thinking about like a Byzantine intellectual or a writer and you know we're thinking, what is the intellectual formation of that person? We shouldn't be thinking only in terms of the cultural production of like the past generation before this person, but what was on that person's shelf, which included a whole bunch of ancient texts too, because they have a very long shelf life. The same is true about the visual landscape of cities in the medieval period because a large part of it consisted of ancient remains, ancient texts that in the case of Byzantium were still legible because they were written in Greek for the most part. There's some Latin texts, but for the most part it's Greek. And so people could, if you could read, you could read those inscriptions from 1,000, 1,500 years ago, whatever. So there is no discrete Byzantine environment in which you are living, it's, as it were, contaminated by all kinds of ancient things as well, uh, even on the level of the urban topography. Uh, right? And when we think about Christians taking over the cities at some point, which they did, like around the 5th century, these cities are full not only of statues and temples, but also of inscriptions that are about statues and temples. And you have to make decisions about well, how much of this is like paganism that contaminates our you know, our life, and we need to, you know, kind of either get rid of it or somewhat suppress it, or do you make a few symbolic choices and just leave the rest and carry on? Because it's a lot of work. Moving, transporting, smashing, or even chiseling out anything in stone is very difficult. My guest today is Anna Zitz from the University of Heidelberg in Germany, and she has written a fascinating book on precisely this topic called Pagan Inscriptions, Christian Viewers, the Afterlives of Temples and Their Texts in the Late Antique Eastern Mediterranean. And what I love about this book is that it looks at these inscriptions and their afterlives, inscriptions and temples, I should say, in their direct, you know, in their primary material form, in the context in which they were viewed in Byzantine times. And I say this is important. We talk about it in the discussion that, so, not so the people who study inscriptions are called epigraphists and I'm not an epigraphist as such I use a lot of inscriptions in my work but that's not my primary area and I encounter inscriptions mostly in their published form or even digitized which strips them entirely of their material aspects but also of their location their surrounding it's not a way by which you can assess how people would have engaged with them, read them, interacted with them, and so on. But that's what she does in the book, uh, which is really, really fascinating. So you can reconstruct the stages by which each of these inscriptions was read and reread and changed and altered, and the different significance that it would have had to readers, you know, 500, 1,000 years after it was put in place. She hits some of the real highlights uh, from this period, like A-list inscriptions like Augustus's Res Gestae, which I mentioned. And as someone who is like epigraphist adjacent, uh, I, I enjoyed it tremendously. A quick note before we get started, 
there is a technical term that is mentioned sometimes without explanation, which is spoliation. Spoliation is the process of using an architectural element from a previous building and reusing it in secondary use in a, in a different building. It gets much more complicated than that, but that's generally what it means. And there's some ancient, um, there's some buildings that have little bits and pieces from other buildings. They, for aesthetic, for practical, for illusions, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, the Chicago Tribune building here in Chicago has a number of these that it sports on its facade right on street level um, and elsewhere, so very famously. So this is an ancient practice too. So spoliation is the process. The item itself is called a spolium, and so in plural, spolia. Um, that's because this is a technical term. Maybe not everybody knows it. Okay, so without any further delay, here is my conversation with Anna Zitz. Anna, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. So let me ask you first about your background, because you have a book about inscriptions, and inscriptions are this odd category of things that are between texts and archaeology and architecture, because they kind of combine all things. So what's your background? How did you come to this topic? So my training is, a, as, is as an archaeologist, um, but with a background in languages um, and an interest in architecture and art history. And so all of these different areas combined into my study of inscriptions, which I would argue Although they are often studied purely as texts on a page, I argue that we actually have to consider them as material objects in space on architecture, um, objects that people could interact with in ways that are different than simply reading them as texts. Yeah, I'm guilty of reading them as texts. So I'm more of a text person. Yeah. yeah. So for the most part, I read them as texts. You know, there are all these online databases, you know, right, where you go and you look at the text. But there are moments when you need to know where this was, what it looked like, what materials it was in. Okay, we'll get to all, we'll get to all that. Um, so first, why don't you tell us a little bit about ancient inscriptions in general? Um, just so that I, I imagine that most of our audience is familiar with them, but like what kinds of things did they do? Right. So um, as we know, Greece and Rome were both um, societies of inscriptions, we could call them. They used inscriptions a lot. They used them everywhere. This is one of the most common categories of material that we might see in museums or on sites when we visit uh, the Mediterranean. Um, and this is in part because there's a lot of marble in the Mediterranean, which is really good for inscribing. It makes it easy to make a lot of inscriptions. Um, but it's also a cultural attitude, right? Um, and so both ancient Greeks and, and Romans would use inscriptions for all sorts of things, for grave texts, so commemorating loved ones, um, but also for putting up civic decrees or royal or imperial letters, um, interstate treaties, et cetera. So anything that you really wanted to um, have in a permanent state uh, could be inscribed on stone and put up in, in public places. Also things like donations of buildings or dedications to gods. These were also very commonly inscribed on stone or on other materials such as bronze and put on public display. Yeah, in Greece, we sometimes line sidewalks with marble. Yes. <laughs> Which I, yes, I lived right? in Athens and yeah, that was always a funny, funny aspect uh, for me, those marble sidewalks, yes. Yes, it strikes Americans as pretty bizarre. <laughs> but I mean, yes. Greece is just a rock. Um, okay, so inscriptions contain text, but they function in many ways above and beyond just communicating information or whatever is in the text. Can you give us a sense of how people might like have interacted with inscriptions in public spaces that went above and beyond the text. Like maybe they weren't even reading what it said, but it, it did communicate certain things by its presence, right? Yes, absolutely. And I think um, in many cases, the material aspects of inscriptions, their visual aspects, how they look, the layouts, the kinds of letter forms used could communicate really effectively, um, you know, some big ideas about um, order and control and power. Um, so when you see a, a building that's covered in really careful, neat writing and organized columns, um, even if you don't know what it says, you can assume that there has been a, you know, a powerful agent behind this inscription um, who has, you know, a control and wealth, et cetera, to put up such a long text in a public space. 
and I think in the ancient in ancient cities, people would have immediately understood this is either a, you know a sort of what we would call a governmental agent or a you know a ruling agent um, or a very wealthy um, donor or, or a civic group, right? Which are also very important um, epigraphic producers. Um, so I think even when people weren't actually reading inscriptions, there was a sort of um, you know perhaps comforting aspect of these very orderly inscribed um, spaces everywhere. And I think people also intuitively understood the, the relationships on display, um, namely connecting um, cities with rulers or with other cities and also then with the gods. So all of these agents are sort of entangled into this, this, this epigraphic web, um, which is really effectively communicated through um, the visual aspects of inscriptions. Yeah, and the inscription itself might be um, carved in a way that suggests some kind of monumentality, right? Like it might evoke the shape of a temple or um, or some, you know, Roman instrument of power like the army or something like that. Um, Absolutely. By the way, yeah. it just occurs to me, so do we have any good evidence for the lettering being painted in? Yes. So in uh, at several uh, in several places we have evidence for um, for example the color red being used in mm. in in inscriptions to make them more visible. I'm not sure that we could say every inscription was painted in that way. Probably we we wouldn't say that. Um, but at least a fair number of them were painted and therefore were more visible than they might seem today when we just see carved letters on on marble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was you know this occurred to me when I was thinking about the Theodosian obelisk base in the Hippodrome where. I was just wondering if like the names of emperors might have been painted in in a different color so that they stand out against it. Anyway, I'm just making stuff up. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, today inscriptions and especially many of the inscriptions that you talk about in your book are used by historians to reconstruct the past. Did ancient historians do this also or even like in late antiquity or Byzantium, did they use ancient inscriptions to reconstruct the ancient past? Yes, so the ancient historians and late antique historians did um, use inscriptions, at least on occasion. So sort of counterintuitively, whereas historians today use epigraphic evidence all the time, it's often some of our best evidence uh, for, for understanding the past, for um, yeah, looking at sociological data, for looking at military events, etc., uh, self-representation, all of these things. Um, uh, ancient historians do not seem to have used inscriptions as much as we might have expected them to, but of course inscriptions do show up and, you know, already in Herodotus, he's, he's talking about inscriptions. And this habit continues in, in late antiquity as well, um, with, of course, the added aspect that many of the inscriptions on display in late antique cities are actually centuries older. Um, so, for example, a good example uh, a good example of this in late antiquity is the historian Agathius of Myrina in the sixth century, who um, he's writing a historical narrative, and he mentions an earthquake that happens uh, in his his own time, and then he wants to draw a connection with an earthquake that had happened centuries earlier in the time of Augustus, and he's sort of interrogating on what's what's the right way to react to an earthquake, right? What's the right attitude of people in cities and also emperors. Um, and he tells the story about how he has visited the city of Trales in Asia Minor, so that's modern Aydin in Turkey. And he, he tells us that when he was there, he heard a story from the people there um, about an earthquake that had struck in the time of Augustus and a particular man named Chiron, um, who had been only a, 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 you know, a normal farmer. He was sort of a rustic guy. He was a normal farmer, but he was so moved with love for his city after seeing this devastation of this earthquake um, that he traveled all the way across the Mediterranean and found the emperor and begged him to help. And then, of course, Augustus sends help and the city is rebuilt, etc. And so Agathius is writing this story and he tells us um, yes, I can confirm that this story is true, that Chiron really existed and that he really was a farmer who traveled all the way across the Mediterranean, um, because I saw a statue base um, uh, when I was visiting Trales, and then he records the epigram that he found on this base. Um, and the epigram is all about, um, yeah, Chiron going to, you know, traveling and getting help for, um, for after the earthquake and then being honored by a local group for having done this, right? 
Um, and so what's really fascinating is that we've actually found the um, statue base that Agathias was looking at in the sixth century. It was found by archeologists in the 1970s. Unfortunately, it's again lost. Um, but in any case, we can confirm Agathias' reading of this epigram. So he was completely able to um, understand and copy this, this epigram. Um, but his, um, his, his interpretation of it was um, influenced by the story that he had heard in Trales that Chiron was only a farmer, right? So this is actually a very typical honorific base. And we know from other uh, inscriptions that Chiron was actually a member of the local elite. Um, he was, you know, probably a Roman citizen. So he was really the top of, of Tralian society, um, which makes a lot more sense historically, of course, that he was, uh, you know, a, a local elite who then sought help from the emperor. Um, so, so Agathius understands this. He's able to read this inscriptions. He uses it as evidence in his um, historical text. But his understanding is, is impacted based on um, the stories that he's heard and the, the message that he wants to project in his in his histories, which is that um, if this really kind of basic farmer could, you know, be so moved by love for his city, then you should also be so moved by love for your city to do anything to, to help the city. It is so rare that we have texts that mention inscriptions and then the inscription as well, so we can confirm it and both confirm and correct the picture that he tells. Uh, yeah, that is extremely rare. In most cases, when ancient historians, you know, mention an inscription, it's, uh, it's like, maybe this is real, maybe it's not. <clears throat> but you mentioned Herodotus, who, of course, mentions a whole range of inscriptions that we're very, very skeptical about, like an inscription by the pyramids about how many onions the workers ate during the construction and things like that, right? So there are clearly cases where these inscriptions are kind of made up in texts to confer some sort of authority on the story or whatever. And you, you have a wonderful discussion of a made up Alexander inscription in, in A Saint's Life. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? Yes. So the Alexander inscription appears in the life of Macarius, um, which is, a, it's a saint's life, but it's also an adventure story. And so in this life, um, three monks set out from their monastery. They want to go on an adventure and find the ends of the earth and the Garden of Eden. And so to do this, they start traveling to the east. And they reach the, the end of the kind of known world in, the, in this period. Um, so they're beyond the worlds of cities and, and, and normal people. And they come upon an arch. And the arch has an inscription on it. And it says, um, this is the Arch of Alexander. Um, and this is the uh, where he um, chased the Persian king, the point to which he chased the Persian, Persian king. So this is, of course, based on the historical, um, real historical events. Um, but then in the narrative, this arch inscription continues and it does something very strange. Uh, it tells the monks, um, if you go to the right there, you, you can't go any further. There's only snakes and scorpions and really nasty things there. So you have to go to the left if you want to to go any further. Um, and so then the monks go to the left, they encounter the Saint Macarius, and he tells them the Garden of Eden is closed, you're not allowed to go there anymore, and they return then to, to, their, to their monastery. Um, so this is really interesting because it shows that um, in this narrative, there's an understanding of the, the genre of um, triumphal arches, and which bear inscriptions typically in the Roman world. Um, uh, but of course, then this totally made up and totally unbelievable elements of, of the arch that gives directions, right? right? Which has no parallel on real arches. Um, but what, what's really interesting is that this, um, this, this sort of made up inscription, it does use uh, a common term found on real arches uh, for founding an arch. So Alexander set up the arch and it uses a, a term that's actually used uh, on real arches. So it's a, an example of intermediate quoting. So even this fake inscription um, uses a, a common real term from, from real arch inscriptions, um, I think to make this totally made up inscription sound a little bit more believable right, uh, right in this narrative. So it shows an understanding of the genre of um, triumphal arches in their inscriptions, um, but it's also using the, the arch in a really interesting way in the narrative. Yeah, and the trope of the you know scorpions and snakes beyond this point, um, I, I think it's pretty common. I I, I I think that Pompey's army encountered a whole bunch of scorpions and snakes when they marched into the Caucasus and, you know, they're heading toward, you know, toward the Caspian Sea and saying, eh, we better go back. And and it keeps happening. It happened to an army of Basil II that was much later. 
Um, mm. and anyway, yeah. So the life of Macarius, I don't know that it's been translated into English, but I think Stratis Papayoanu is is about to uh, publish a translation of that. Oh, wonderful! Uh, yeah, we'll it's we'll be looking text. forward to that. Yeah, 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 it's a great text. So yeah, um, so yeah, there were these ways of trying to make fake inscriptions seem real, but then there were also ways of making real inscriptions let's say perform prophetic duties and you know they're kind of oracular in a way so how did they read ancient inscriptions or past inscriptions as talking about the future like in real time yes so um so we have several um literary sources late antique literary sources which um, make use of an use of inscriptions as um prophetic agents in their narratives, right? So there's a story in both um, uh, Ammianus Marcellinus and in Socrates Scholasticus. So these two historians with very different perspectives, one a classicizing historian and the other an ecclesiastical historian focusing on church history. Um, and they both include a story of um, a prophetic inscription that is found when the walls of um, uh, Chalcedon are being uh, demolished by the emperor Valens in the in the fourth century. Um, and so they both have the story that the walls are being taken apart and an inscribed stone is found which um, prophesies a, a barbarian invasion uh, if ever the stone is taken and used as spolia to build a bath. Um, and so in the narrative, um, Valens at first refuses to listen to the stone and then he's persuaded. Um, he stops the demolition of the walls. Um, but of course, the barbarian invasion happens nonetheless. Um, so obviously this is a completely made up um, story, but I think it's based on a real, real context that were happening in late antiquity of people um, demolishing things and finding um, mysterious stones and hard to read letters and having to decide what to do with them. Um, and so, so, so within the narratives, stories like this are functioning, you know, to, to build suspense to, you know, whatever, in various different narratological ways. Um, so that's one example where the the um, inscription could have, this is a made up inscription, but it could have be based on something that people could actually read. Uh, in other contexts, for example, in Egypt, and again, in Socrates Scholasticus, we have the um, uh, supposed discovery of a, prophes of a prophecy um, written in Egyptian hieroglyphics um, during the destruction of the Serapeon in Alexandria in 391 or around 391. Um, and so here, uh, you know, in, in reality, people in the fourth century could usually not read Egyptian hieroglyphics. There were perhaps a few um, priests who could still read them, but it would be very, very rare. Um, but we have this story that uh, during the destruction, um, hieroglyphs were found and that then they're interpreted as a prophecy of, um, you know, the um, coming of, you know, Christ has come and now everybody's going to convert to Christianity, et cetera. Um, so again, there, these inscriptions are put to use in late antiquity, whether they're real or imagined, um, they're put to use in late antique um, textual sources to, to, um, to sort of build the, the late antique world that the author is, is aiming to build. Yeah, I suppose it wouldn't be entirely unreasonable to expect that an ancient inscription might have a prophecy uh, on it. After all, I mean, they put all kinds of things in inscriptions. I mean, just ranging from like the the inscriptions that I dealt with once were those on the carved on the Parthenon in Byzantine times, and they're just okay. Most of them are just con conventional epitaphs, like for bishops and monks who were buried there. But there's one guy who went around and he was trying to count the number of the columns on the Parthenon, and he carved like the number of columns is fifty four or something, and he missed a few oddly. Um, and then there's another one who carves a curse um, against someone who's sleeping with his girlfriend. <laughs> and it, it's wild. It's wild the things that you find in, in inscriptions. And some of the wildest stuff is what would otherwise be the most dry and boring things. That is, administrative bureaucratic documents are sometimes carved in stone at great length, like your tax declarations. You put it in stone. Um, so there are these monuments that you talk about, and you call it performative bureaucracy. I, I love that term. So Milasa is a is a great example about that. So how were like even temples used for like bureaucratic? And why would you record a bureaucratic document in stone like that at all? And why would you do it on a temple? Yes, that's a yeah, great question. So in fact, this tradition goes all the way back to the Hellenistic period in Asia Minor. 
um, this tradition of using temples and occasionally other building walls like stoas as places where you inscribe long documents. Um, and sometimes this is because the, you know, a Hellenistic king has, has stated or a bureaucrat has stated, um, inscribe this at the sanctuary of so-and-so or inscribe this in a very visible place. Um, and other times, presumably the city, it's it, the people in the city itself decided where they wanted to inscribe things. But in any case, there's this long tradition of using um, wall space as a place where you inscribe documents, which I think probably nobody ever actually stopped and stood and read, right? It's not very easy to read lengthy documents on walls, um, whether you're inscribing in the mm. Hellenistic and Roman tradition of columns of text, or um, as, as you mentioned in the late antique habit of inscribing documents where sometimes they're inscribed not in neat columns, but in very, very long lines. So at Melissa, the example um, uh, is, 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 uh, is a document of the fifth century uh, CE, which is inscribed in lines four and a half meters long on this podium wall of the temple. So it's very, very long. You, you know, if you wanted to read it, you would sort of have to start at one end and walk and then walk back and then walk back. Um, so presumably nobody actually stood there and, and read it, right? But it does make this very, uh, it gives this very impressive, um, you know, um, uh, imp makes an impressive, um, uh, you know, appearance on this wall. And I think it's about this performative aspect of, um, you know, the, the, the imperial official said to put it up in a visible place. We put it up in a visible place. And, you know, we can sort of point to it if anybody says, uh, you know, has a, has a tax dispute or whatever we can say, well, it's there and you, you have to follow that, whether or not anybody actually went to read it. Yeah, the other, um, well, it was about a month ago now, I attended a talk here on some temples in southern India in like around the 10th century AD, which have thousands of lines of administrative text carved on the outside with specific provisions about individual people who are entitled to draw so much, you know, from the treasury or support their salaries, but they're named and their addresses where they live. And uh, you got, wow. Yes. You That's gotta, fascinating. It is. And like those kinds of documents would become obsolete or, you know, the information would be out of date very fast. And it's pretty clear that they're, codifying a kind of social order like the specific information is kind of secondary it's more like the the lines of power and who gives to whom in the different classes of society and so forth and anyway I, I think a lot of that is going on in some of the roman administrative documents that get put up this way too uh the most famous of all of these by far is augustus's res gestae right and and so this is a it's very famous text uh put up all over the empire in Greek and Latin, respectively. Can you tell us what this text is and what it was doing there, especially at Ankara, and something about its later history? You talk about this a lot in the book. Yes, so the Res Gestae is one of the most famous texts that we have from the ancient world. Um, if if you've ever taken Latin, you probably had to read at least part of the Res Gestae at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is um, Augustus's autobiographical account of his own accomplishments, right? Res Gestae means accomplishments. Um, his military accomplishments, his um, political ones, his, you know, the buildings that he's he's built, et cetera, what he's done to help the Roman people. Um, so, of course, it's fascinating as a text, as an example of um, his imperial self-representation, et cetera, how he frames himself uh, vis-a-vis others in, in, in his own time period. Um, and it's been well studied by many, many scholars um, for what it tells us about August the period of Augustus and, 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 and the early um, first century CE. Um, but what has not really been considered is what happened to this text in later periods. And so the best preserved uh, copy we have is from Ankara, uh, again, in the capital of modern Turkey, um, where we have this wonderful temple of Augustus in Roma that's still standing today. So right now it's in the middle of a very busy um, city district. It's a very um, sort of outlier monument. It's very interesting to, to visit. Um, and the, the Reis Gestae was copied in, in the period of Augustus. It was copied and put up or right after his death um, it was copied and put up in both Greek and Latin on this on this building. Um, 
And so my interest uh, has been in what happened to this building in late antiquity. So the building was still standing. Uh, Ankara was still a very active uh, city. It was, in fact, a, a place where emperors in the fourth century were coming and stopping and spending a lot of time. Um, and we, the, the short answer is that we don't really know how this temple was used in late antiquity. Presumably, it stopped being used as a, as a place of pagan worship. Uh, there's some evidence that it was converted into a church, which I think is entirely plausible. Um, but in any case, whether it was converted into a church or not, this uh, these these two copies of the raised guest eye were still on display. Um, and it was certainly an area that people were still visiting in late antiquity. Um, uh, and so I, I did some research, um, I looked at what some other scholars have written on um, perspectives on Augustus in late antiquity. Um, so of course some, you know, some late antique authors liked him, some didn't, uh, but there's this trend in the uh, Christian, Christian writers um, to view Augustus as um, not so much as a political leader, but actually as an essential part of the story of the birth of Christ. Right. So because he's mentioned in, in, in the Bible, the decree mm -hmm. went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Um, he's seen as a sort of, a, a, you know, a player in this, this narrative of Christ's birth um, and also his political accomplishments of bringing the Pax Romana are seen by Christian authors in this period um, uh, through the lens of, of, of you know, um, God creating a, a, a place for Christianity to flourish, right? So the Pax Romana in this view is not the, the reason why Christianity could, um, could flourish. It's sort of um, because of Christianity, um, God um, allowed Augustus to bring about this Pax Romana and to create this, this Roman empire. Um, so in fact, Augustus then becomes a very important figure in, in, um, in, late, in late antiquity. Um, and so I think there were people coming and looking at the temple. Um, they were probably reading uh, the text from various different viewpoints. Uh, the raised guest eye is, of course, a very long text. So again, I don't think anybody would stand there and actually read from start to finish. Uh, but the text does have this very convenient heading, which tells you in short, short form, um, these are the accomplishments of the god Augustus, um, you know, that were set up in Rome. And here is our copy of it. So I think people would have understood what was being said. And what's very interesting is that although we don't have any definite proof of people in late antiquity reading it, uh, we do have three Middle Byzantine grave texts that are um, carved right below the Greek uh, copy of the raised gestae. And one of them is even imitating the earlier letter forms, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. Um, so there's certainly this awareness of, of this text and interaction with it. And there's also some crosses um, carved below the Greek uh, copy of the raised gestae. Um, so again, this is, this is my goal, is to put this text, the raised gestae, um, back in its monumental context, on its architectural context, and look at what is actually surrounding it and, and bringing those threads together to understand how people interacted with this text in later periods. Your book does that very well. And I have to say, it's something that people like me constantly need to be reminded of because, you know, I think of the rest guest as a text. I go to the, my library and I pick it off the shelf, right? And it's a bit counterintuitive for me to think that, no, it was this thing it was this massive thing in a city that was along one of the main routes across Asia Minor. And a lot of very important people went by there and they would have stopped there and they would have seen this. And so, for example, like much later than the period you discussed, like Basil II, whom I mentioned earlier, in 996, he issues this edict about, it's about land ownership and under what circumstances you can claim your land back and whatever, whatever. And he has this one provision where he says, that under certain conditions, you have to prove the the property, the ownership history of this land back to the time of Caesar Augustus, like a thousand wow. years earlier. And like for a moment, I thought, why would he think of Caesar Augustus? Like, okay, the beginning of the monarchy, I get it, but but if you think that he had been through there, right? Like he had seen that text, and who knows, you know, maybe someone read it to him anyway. Uh, yeah, that's a whole different dimension. Um, by the way, so was that temple turned into a monastery in like middle or later Byzantine times? Because I kept reading that, that there were monks living next to the rest guest. And I 
So yeah, this is a this is something that's always been assumed um, because there is one grave inscription of a hegumenos, um, uh, a Christian, a Christian, a leader of a monastery. Um, in my opinion, that doesn't necessarily mean that the building itself was turned into a monastery. I think it's possible that it was used actually for for burial because we have at least one other grave text inside the temple, and then these three on the on the exterior. So it may have been the case that a monastery was located. Um, within this complex, right within the the um, yeah. yeah, this this walled area, which was at the you know in Middle Byzantine periods outside the main citadel of of Ankara, um, but who knows? Maybe it was used as a monastery. It's a, it's a kind of nice image. Yeah, and they probably um, you know hazed all the novices by having them write down the inscription. <laughs> yeah, um, that would be great. So you mentioned. Um, Christian readings of these ancient inscriptions. And a lot of your book is about this. Um, so let's ease into that topic too. And I imagine that many people in the audience will assume that, you know, Christians were by definition sort of hostile to the pagan aspects of these inscriptions, um, or that there was some effort to erase them or take them down, especially when not only they mentioned the gods, but they were often in conjunction with statues or temples or like functioning in a kind of overtly pagan kind of way. And we'll talk about that in a moment, but first, um, give us a glimpse into the pagan side of this equation in late antiquity. So you start by talking these wonderful inscriptions from Megara uh, in Greece that are late antique and kind of looking back. So tell us about that story. Yes, so Megara, um, in Megara, so in late antiquity, um, copies were made of two, at least two older inscriptions. I'll just speak about one of them um, here. So we've, we've found in a late antique inscription from Megara, which states um, the priest Taladius, here presumably a pagan priest, um, made a copy of this older inscription um, because it had been worn away by time. And then uh, the copy of the inscription follows. And in fact, it's an epigram uh, dating from the period of the Persian Wars, so almost a thousand years earlier, right? Um, and the epigram is commemorating the uh, Megarian soldiers who died in that war, and it's an epigram of Simonides of Chaos, right? Um, and so this was a fascinating example of a, a late antique stonemason copying a much older inscription, perhaps with a Hellenistic or, or Roman intermediary text in there, you know, inscribed text that's actually being copied from, that's a little unclear. Um, uh, but what's really interesting is that the, the late antique inscription ends with the statement, we continue to sacrifice bulls for these Megarian soldiers um, up until the present day. Um, so this text, as Angelos Haniotis has pointed out, um, not many people really felt the need to write that they sacrificed uh, made pagan sacrifices um, prior to the fourth century when it becomes, let's say, mm. controversial in some way, um, uh, limited, legally limited. Um, and so, in fact, what's on display here is a very um, self-conscious late antique uh, revival of, of an older idea, right? Sort of going back to the glory days of, of, of Hellenic Megara, right? The Persian War, uh, and, and sort of epigraphically reincarnating these Megarian soldiers um, uh, again, to fight this time, not the Persians, but the rising uh, Christian dominance, I think, in this period. And, and in fact, making claims that the Hellenic past is still valuable and still uh, necessary uh, in this period. Um, and so that's the, the view that we get from, from Megara. Um, but in fact, it's a fairly unusual, um, uh, something that's fairly unusual is this copying of a much older uh, text. So much more often, we simply have the preservation in place of older texts. And in some cases, I think this can also be attributed to, if not pagan, you know, pagans deciding to preserve it, but at least in a continuing interest in the Hellenic past or in the local past in, in other cases. Um, and, and so this, this desire to preserve that past um, in the late antique present. Right. So if some pagans felt the need to reassert this continuity or, or reestablish it or invent it, right? But at any rate, to sort of make it known to whoever passes by the inscription that, hey, we're still doing this. The Christians, on the other hand, found themselves kind of immersed in an environment that was had already been filled up with you know, temples and statues and inscriptions and, and all of these things were interlinked, right? Like the, 
you couldn't draw a line between sec secular and, and 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 religious very easily in an ancient city because all of these things were kind of right mixed up even like decrees of the athenian demos from antiquity have begin with the, the gods at the top right it's the, uh, uh, and so christians they probably had to prioritize um and so let's just abuse the audience of any idea that that Christians sort of set about systematically sterilizing their environment from from pagan associations. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? In other words, some striking examples of Christian either toleration of this material or indifference or even just holding on to it for reasons of their own. Yes. Yeah, so as you pointed out, um, in, we're finding increasing evidence that, in fact, these late antique Christians were usually pretty tolerant of the of the pagan past. So there are many temples that were, in fact, um, preserved or they might have been uh, reused for buildings, um, you know, reused as building material, not necessarily for churches. Uh, they might have simply fallen down naturally. So, in fact, the the evidence we have for active destruction is is fairly rare. Um, the same with statues. We know that many ancient statues, even those of pagan gods, were um, still on display in late antique cities. They were actually kind of desirable collector's items. Um, many of them were moved to Constantinople by Constantine and by others who wanted to have these, um, you know, these sort of valuable art objects on display and sort of reinterpret them, right, as art objects rather than as active um, cults figures or as active active agents as as gods, right? Um, and but of course, there's 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 limits to that tolerance. So we also do see statues that are defaced or have crosses added to them, um, or are deposited, etc. Um, and so this this has all been fairly well researched um, in, in the recent scholarship. And so what I want to do is then add inscriptions to this picture mm -hmm. and, and look at this. And as you as you said, I mean, um, the vast majority of inscriptions that have come down to us show no Christian editing or modification or destruction, et cetera. Um, most of them were simply tolerated, left in place. Um, in fact, it's pretty rare to have crosses added to, to inscriptions. Um, and there are you know, a couple of examples where there's sort of the striking preservation um, at um, Aizani, so a, a city in central Anatolia in Phrygia. Um, we have a wonderful temple of Zeus, which is still standing today. Um, if you, you know, if you Google it, you'll find um, pictures of this temple that's still standing up to the roof line in many places. Um, and this is not anastylosis, right? So this is not something that archaeologists have put back up. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been standing since antiquity. Um, and uh, we know that Aizani was also an active late antique city. We have churches elsewhere in the city. We have building projects elsewhere in the city. Um, so this was still an active place, right? So they chose to leave the temple standing. We're not sure if it was reused as a church or anything else in late antiquity. Um, but also on the walls, we have, again, this, um, you know, these, these Roman documents this time. It's some Roman bureaucratic documents uh, related to land ownership of the temple and then also to some other, um, uh, other yeah, bureaucratic aspects. And several of these documents mention Zeus. Uh, I mean, you know, they're on the temple of Zeus. They mention Zeus. Um, and there seems to have been no problem with these in late antiquity. They were left in place. We have um, a couple of crosses, graffiti, cross graffiti carved below them. Of course, we can't date that. It could be later um, Byzantine graffiti. Uh, but in any case, nobody felt the need to, to destroy or to edit um, these texts. Um, also at a site that I'm uh, currently working at as a member of the archaeological team, the site is called Phoenix, and this is also in Asia Minor. Uh, in the uh, Carian Kersonesis, which is the Rhodian Perea, so sort of southern Turkey. Um, it's a wonderful Hellenistic site, which is then continuing continued use in late antiquity. And we have a church there um, built um, of spolia, including many, many ancient inscriptions. Mm -hmm. And we just found some more this past um, past summer in our in our field season. Um, many of them are grave texts, so not particularly um, religiously charged texts, but we do have, um, uh, you know, a, a dedication to Apollo um, in really big letters, so like three centimeter tall letters, very clear, crystal clear, perfectly preserved, um, and it's set right at one of the doorways into the church, right at eye level, so, you know, wow. you cannot miss this, it's, it's really visible, um, and so I think this is, again, an, an indication of, of tolerance shown towards these texts. I will say, though, from my from my research, it's pretty rare to have um, 
a, an inscription naming a god built into a church so prominently. So we do have some other examples where they make some edits or make some, um, yeah, erase a little bit of, of a text. And I think we'll come to that a little bit later. Uh, but on the whole, there's 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 really a, a lot of evidence for um, tolerance in this period um, of, of you know Christians tolerating uh, pagan material. And I think also probably the sort of a cultural coin a of simply accepting that this is this is part of our visual field this is part of our our culture and that it doesn't always come down to just this question of christian versus pagan uh, competition yeah my 1990s training kind of leads me to instinctively reach for some kind of pagan versus christian right so um immediately i was thinking wow that's interesting maybe they thought he was the the missionary apollon and described in acts of the apostles um, maybe ah, there's some exegetical text, I think, from late antiquity, which argued that Apollon etymologically means not many and ah, the alpha privative and, oh, and that it therefore refers to like the one God. <laughs> anyway, but oh, that's no, fascinating. I mean, yeah. No, I think your approach is probably right. Like they, they probably either knew what this was or it wasn't like that big a deal. And besides, anyone who could read it by definition had probably like read some Homer at some point, even if he was a Christian or right? like this. And so this was like, it wasn't, it was harmless. It was kind of just part of the, anyway. Okay. You'll tell us what that inscription is doing there. The church, once you publish that site. Um, so um, there are some even more extreme examples of this. Uh, so you talk in the book about the temple of Aphrodite at her homonymous city of Aphrodisias where um, inscriptions in honor of the goddess Aphrodite, which arguably is like one of the hardest ones for Christians to kind of stomach in many contexts, end up on the inside of a church. That's pretty dramatic. How does that happen? Yes. So Aphrodisias is one of our um, best preserved temple churches uh, that's been archaeologically excavated and really well documented. Um, so this conversion probably took place from the temple to, to a church, probably around 500 uh, CE. Um, and at that time, the builders and Aphrodisias, they took down the blocks of the temple, um, but they left up the peristyle columns of the temple. So the columns that, that go around the, the temple. Um, and then they simply build the walls of the church um, from these other spoliated blocks all around that. Um, and so the result is that the dedications to Aphrodite that were on these columns of the temple end up inside the church. Um, so they're facing into the side aisles um, mm. and they're on these columns. And so on the one hand, they would not have been, I think, extremely visible within the church because, as I said, they're facing into the side aisles. Um, they're a little bit higher up on these columns and they're, the letters here are pretty small. Um, so again, we come back to this, this aspect of the material aspects of, of inscriptions are actually important for, for interpreting them. Um, so the letters are pretty small. So I don't think they were extremely visible. Um, but again, we see this tolerance um, you know, demonstrated towards these inscriptions. So none of the builders apparently thought, oh, we have to remove these um, in, in the case of the columns. Now, another inscription, a dedication of Aphrodite, um, ends up in the church, and that one actually is erased. So this was the door into the temple of Aphrodite. Mm. Um, it was a monumental door frame. Um, it's, the door frame is taken down and reused as the main door into the, the nave of the church. And there, the dedication to Aphrodite um, and the mention of her temple is really thoroughly erased. Um, some of the other parts of the text are left visible or semi-visible, but that part is really thoroughly erased. Um, so I think this has to do with um, first liminal spaces, if we can talk about that, the sort of transitional spaces where you have to define um, the place that you're going into or your attitude mm -hmm. towards the place that you're entering into. Uh, but then also, again, the visibility of, of this really um, monumental dedication, right, which would, would have been really easy to read and in that case uh, required some editing. Yeah, what about inscriptions that are placed on the ground where people walk on them? I remember these used to be sometimes interpreted as a kind of triumphalist statement that you're trampling the paganism of those inscriptions underfoot. And you kind of push back against that. So what's the context there? Yes, yeah, so at a few sites, we have these inscriptions that are laid um, into floors as, as paving stones. Um, and a lot of this triumphalist interpretation has come from uh, the life of Porphyry of Gaza. So this, this late antique or also maybe later mm. uh, life 
um, and which is really full of, um, you know, this triumphalist attitude towards spolia, not towards inscriptions particularly, but towards taking the blocks of a temple and laying them in the floor and specifically stating, you know, this was in order to um, to shame the god and have people and animals walking all over it and everything. Um, and so that interpretive framework is, has been frequently adopted by scholars to, to explain um, floors where there are inscriptions built into it. For example, at Parini, where we have um, several texts built into the late antique uh, basilica that's not that far away from the, the famous temple of Athena there. Um, but I push back against this um, in part because of the content of inscriptions. And so here I do think content is important um, because at sites like Parini or at Canidos, the inscriptions that are built into the floor are actually um, honorific decrees. Uh, so sort of um, the city passing a decree saying that we want to honor this person for doing something good for our city. Um, so they're not text honoring gods or goddesses. They're not um, dedications to gods or goddesses. They're not mm -hmm. anything that really has to do with um, uh, religion, with ritual practice or anything like that. Um, so in these cases, I think it was simply that these stones were conveniently shaped. They were nice. Um, in some cases, I think there may have also been an aesthetic of inscribed space. So the desire to use um, older stones to, to sort of add this, um, you know, texture, if you will, so texture to, to these spaces. And we see this also at um, Sardis in a synagogue, um, which also makes use of uh, spoliated inscriptions. Um, some in Greek, um, one is in a very, um, a, a, a very unusual inscription, which is in an um, epicoric Anatolian language that we still don't actually know what it is. And presumably in late antique Sardis, they also could not actually read this, this text. Um, but they, they have these various um, uh, spoliated inscribed stones in this space. Um, also then contemporary late antique dedications from members of the Jewish community. And it's overall a very, um, a very elaborate and rich space. It's very heavily decorated. Um, it's very clear that they made decisions, aesthetic decisions about how they wanted the space to look. And that included the spoliated inscriptions. And I think that's at play in some of the other uh, churches, also in some of the churches as well. Yeah, after all, in some churches, they laid down floor mosaics that included dedications um, and honoring people who had paid for some of the construction. And you walk on those floors. And this wasn't done to insult those people, quite the contrary. Um, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's one of those cases where when you look at an individual case and you say, ah, yes, they're trampling under that. And you have this one saint's life that seems to confirm it. It's done. But it, the broader context is it's really not, not that very much. Um, though I was intrigued by, so you mentioned earlier that they carefully erased out the religious uh, aspect of of the um, doorway inscription. And you talk about some other inscriptions that were, so where specific interventions were made to chisel out words that might give offense. And it made me hold, think of this whole cancel culture kind of context where they're, they're literally, like they're keeping the context but erasing the name. Um, so can you talk a little bit, uh, tell us about some more of those inscriptions and, and why that was done, like how strategically was it done? Yes, yeah, so we have a few other inscriptions um, where we have the names of pagan gods erased. Um, and so this is pretty rare. As I said, most inscriptions are tolerated. Uh, but at sites like Ephesus, we occasionally have uh, the name of Artemis erased. Um, also at sites like uh, Azani again. So in a different, uh, different uh, context, so not the Temple of Zeus that I talked about before, um, but on a... Uh, colonnaded street in that city built in the late antique period, uh, there was a, a spolia from a temple of Artemis. So blocks from the temple that was taken down and then reused to build this street, um, including the architrave with the dedication uh, to Artemis um, from this priest. You know, this priest built the temple for Artemis, basically is what it says. Um, and there we have a really uh, careful erasure, really thorough erasure of the name of Artemis and also the name of the priest. But then the last part of the inscription is left um, completely legible. So he founded the temple. Doesn't say which temple, doesn't say to whom the temple was dedicated, um, but he founded the temple is left visible. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, I think it's a little bit different than council culture because I don't think the goal here was sort of to, um, to in any way um, shame or cancel the pagan past or, or anything. 
Um, I would rather say it's more like um, consciously uncoupling, to use another kind of trendy contemporary term for mm. um, for rela- a relationship ending and splitting up. Right. So I think it's about putting some distance between the late antique majority Christian present and the pagan past by saying, OK, we're going to take away this specific name. We're going to take away um, anything that would imply that we're sort of pro-pagan, uh, but we're going to leave enough that it's clear we're not, you know, religious fanatics. We're not, you know, and we're going to carry out the erasures very carefully. So these are professionally done erasures. They're not, you know, somebody getting up there with a hammer and just going at it. Um, so yeah, so I think it's a little bit more nuanced than than just cancel um, culture, um, but that's something I think uh, you know I'd like to talk with other uh, scholars about uh, as well. Yeah, no, I like that about your book very much. I mean, you have very nuanced discussions of all these different categories of of treatment of ancient inscriptions in 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 this place and that, and you end with a general some general advice to the field about the materiality of these objects and i think we should end on that uh because you're quite right about all this and and i i wanted to ask you if you could kind of explain to a general audience what the emphasis on materiality means to you like what what does it help us do that previous scholarship had missed so far because a lot of scholarship had missed a lot of the things that you talk about here so what does materiality mean to you in this context as a methodology? Yes. Yeah, so going back to something that we've already discussed, I'm, I mean, we've talked about how inscriptions have traditionally been read as text on a page. Um, and I just want to say, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. As you know, I think that's a very valuable thing to do to interpret these, these inscriptions as, as text and to use them as historical sources. Um, so my book is not kind of against, against that sort of method. Sure. Um, But I just want to argue that we can expand um, our understanding of these inscriptions by adding this other component of of looking at materiality. And so with materiality, I mean, looking at all the material aspects or the physical aspects of, um, you know, what does it mean for for an inscription to be on marble? Um, Where did the marble come from? How big is it? Where is it? Where was it originally placed? Um, and then also, you know, what does this material aspect mean for its potentials for reuse, for, for later interpretation, um, for it remaining in place for centuries afterwards? Uh, and so looking at, you know, fine context, um, not only original display locations, um, looking for any evidence of um, reuse, of editing, of reinterpretation of the stone, and then also thinking in terms of the, you know, cultural um, expectations of, of that kind of material. So what, what were the expectations of marble or cultural um, understandings of marble as, as a material in this, in this period and, um, and putting that all together. So for me, it's about expanding the, the kinds of questions we can ask of inscriptions. Um, and I think we can only do that by first at least acknowledging um, epigraphers and, and you know, people publishing inscriptions, acknowledging these are material objects, they're archeological objects. And we can approach them from a variety of ways. So that's what I'd really like to see in uh, in the field of epigraphy in the the coming years. Exactly, because the publication of the text is kind of unidimensional, right? It captures only one aspect of these. Um, And depending on like even the printing capabilities, you know, of the publisher, you lose the images that are associated with the text, you lose the architectural content, all kinds of things. Actually, I had discussed this with Linda Safran in the episode on diagrams where the publication of texts often don't, don't include the diagrams because they're just not part of our editorial publishing standard. I mean, you know, practice and, and, and they, she had to go look through the manuscripts again to find the, the, the diagram. Um, good. So what's your next project? You can leave us with that. And what, what do we look forward to next from you? Yes, well, I'll be continuing a, a lot of work on inscriptions and, uh, yeah, uh, looking at them as material obje- objects. As I've already mentioned, this uh, Phoenix project where we're finding a lot of exciting material, um, you know, in the field, and then also looking at uh, various other uh, inscribed uh, inscribed contexts and, and thinking in terms of um, what's going on in these places in, in later periods. Well, thank you very much, Anna, for coming on to the podcast and for writing the book. I, I enjoyed it very much. I... I... In part because it just offers this sort of alternative window into people reading these inscriptions who are like not 19th century French and German epigraphists. Yes, so. there's so many different ways to read inscriptions, and that's what I really wanted to communicate in the book. So thank you so much for having me on here and letting me talk about uh, talk about this. My pleasure. Take care, Anna. Thank you. You too.